Hey, Rocky Fork, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will stay connected by downloading our app. <laughs> Hi, neighbor. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? I've got a special treat for you today, neighbors. I'm starting a new book today. I'm sure you'd like to hear all about it. It's called Jesus Next door. I, I don't even know. I don't even know. Um, so what I didn't know is that they were going to take my audition tape for the praise team and play it like that. No idea. Jonathan said my application is stuck in committee. So you notice I'm not singing, right? Um, well, good morning. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the ministers here in the Rocky Fork neighborhood. Um, and I'm glad to be with you here this morning. And we're starting this new sermon series called Jesus Next Door. And, and I'm super excited about it. Um, and, and really, it's all about what we can do to make a difference right where we are. Um, so we want to be Jesus for people in our neighborhood. Um, but before we get started, I, I want to I give you a little bit of a story. Um, and I'm a military guy. I spent 23 years in the Air Force, so I've got lots of military stories I could share, but I'm just going to share this one today. Um, so one, I, I was in communications. That's what I did. I maintained communication links and uh, one of my jobs um, was to maintain communication links between uh, troops on the ground on the battlefront, so imagine Iraq and Afghanistan, and people who were in support, who were flying air support or watching over them. So I had a team that maintained those video links. And you can imagine that that's pretty important stuff. So imagine a convoy driving down the road, returning to base after a routine patrol. And they, there's somebody flying over them, there's video of them, their convoy, and they're in audio contact with the convoy on the ground. And so what they're trying to do is warn them of any danger. That's really what they're there for, to protect the people on the ground. So my team was responsible for maintaining the video and audio links. And we were pretty good. If something broke, it was usually fixed in like five minutes. Five minutes is pretty good. That's really quick for a repair, but it's not really quick if you're the guy on the ground, right? So what we, what we wanted to do was cut that time it took to fix those links. So what we found out was about four minutes of our time was spent getting the call saying, hey, the link is down, and then going to the place to fix the link. That was the majority of the time. It only took us like 30 seconds to fix things. So the answer, of course, is to have my team sit with the guy who's on the radio with the convoy. Pretty simple stuff, right? Well, that means that my team is just kind of Right? They're just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They got nothing to do waiting for something to break. Imagine if, if you took a mechanic with you every time you got in your car, just in case it broke. Right? 
You, you wouldn't, like, that mechanic would be bored out of his mind 99% of the time. But that 1% of the time, you'd be happy he was there, right? Well, that's just a drive down the street. We're talking convoys in a combat zone. My guys weren't having it. Like, we've got stuff to do, chief. We can't do this. We, we've, got a, we've got other work that we need to do. Okay, let me help you understand. So I showed them a video. And it was a video of a convoy that was attacked, had an IED attack, uh, improvised explosive device, hit the convoy, and then in come the enemy to attack afterward. Now, fortunately, nobody was hurt in this particular attack, but this video was shot, was recorded, while the video link was down. So, turns out, if we would have done the repair in the first 30 seconds, they would have known about the attack, and they could have avoided it. And so, I told my guys, this is why we do what we do. It's important. It's life and death for those guys on the ground. What you do matters. And at that point, the light bulb went on. You know, it's like, oh, I get it. And from then on, they weren't just willing to give up some time. They were eager to give up some time because they wanted to be there to support their brothers and sisters on the ground. All right, so that's a really nice story. You know, what's the point? What's the point? The thing is, once you understand why, it's really easy to stay on target, on task. Their mission was important, and they needed to know that. Can I just share something with you? Our mission is important. And I would say that our mission is even more important than theirs. Because our mission has eternal consequences. Our purpose has eternal consequences. At the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus gives us our mission. He gives us the Great Commission. And this is something you've heard here many times. But Matthew 28, verse, starting in verse 18, says, The Lord came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded them. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. This mission statement has eternal consequence. See, here's the thing. Every single person is going to live for eternity. And the question is where they're going to spend that eternity. With God or separated from him. Our mission, the why of what we do, is so, so important. It's the purpose behind everything that we do. It is our purpose to help people to see Jesus, to see what he has done, to see the hope that he offers and only he offers and to accept it for themselves. That's our purpose to help people to know Jesus. And the way we do it is we love them like he loves them. So my question for you this morning is simple and direct. What are you doing to accomplish the mission that Jesus set before us? If that seems harsh, 
to you, it's intentional. What are you doing? What are you doing to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given to us? And I know it's intimidating when you hear that mission statement. It's like, go into all the nations. And you're like, Chris, I'm not called to be a missionary. I'm not called to go to these far off places and and lead people to Christ. That's not what I'm... Can I tell you something? The Great Commission happens right here. It happens right here. Listen to what Paul says to the people of Athens. He, he's on a missionary journey going through Athens, and, and he runs into this altar. He's been preaching the good news, and he runs into this altar that they created. And this altar, the inscription on it says, to an unknown God. And Paul is just distraught. He's like, these people are worshiping a God that they don't even know. And so he says this to them in Acts chapter 17, starting verse 24. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands. As if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. Listen to this. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. Paul reminds the people of Athens of who God is. He is the creator and the sustainer of life. He can do anything. There is nothing that he can't do as the giver of life. And then Paul says that profound thing. He says, God put every single person, every single person at a particular place, at a particular time, so that they might find him there. How amazing is it? That God put every single person in the right place so they could find him. And then Paul says he's not far away from any of us. Here's the thing. If you know Jesus, right? If you follow Jesus, the spirit lives in you, right? You're not far from your neighbors. The spirit is in you. The spirit is around you. He's not far from any of us. Paul says in Romans 1 that that he is, God is evident in creation. Everybody can see him. He is there. Not far away. Here's the thing. What was true for the people of Athens is true for us. There are 1,662 people in Hallsville. 185,840 people in Boone County. And those people were put in this place, in Hallsville, in Boone County, at this time, so they could find Jesus. That's why they're here. Here's what we know about people. If we categorize people, You know, census and surveys tell us that 25% of of the American population has no religious affiliation. They don't, we can definitively say that 25% don't know Jesus. We can definitively say that. The number's probably higher. But we can definitively say that 25% don't. What that means is there are 415 people in Hallsville who don't need Jesus. But Jesus... He put them there so they could find him. 
There are 46,450 people in Boone County that God put there so, he, so they could find him. That is why they're here. And he placed you here with a mission, with a purpose to make disciples, to be the people who lead those lost sheep home. Your mission is important, and God orchestrated all of this perfectly. He gave you a purpose for where you are. He gave them a purpose for being where they are. They need him, and your purpose is to help them find him. That may feel like a heavy burden. That may feel like a heavy burden. It feels like a heavy burden to me. But remember what Paul said early in that passage. He said, God doesn't need our help. Right? Can I just tell you what that means? You are not responsible for saving the 415 in Hallsville. You're not responsible for saving the 46,000 in Boone County. You are responsible for delivering the message. God is the only one who can save them. So let that burden go. Your responsibility is to share the good news. To live in a way that points people to Jesus so they will be drawn to him, not you. So what does it look like to, you know, we, we say know Jesus and love like him. That's what we're here to do. What does that look like? What does it look like to know Jesus and love like him? If you want an answer for that, you should probably go to the teacher. What does Jesus say about what it looks like to know him and to love like him? We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 25. You can turn your Bibles there or your app. Um, but I just want to set the stage at the beginning of chapter 10. Uh, Luke has sent out the 72 to towns and cities all around to preach the good news and tell them, hey, Jesus is coming. And he welcomes them back after their journey and, and he celebrates their success and there's joy amongst them and they are just thrilled with what has happened. And then this happens, starting in verse 25. It says this, One occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? What's written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? You're a lawyer. Answer your question. Um, And the lawyer answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise.
you've all heard this story before. The story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is challenged by this lawyer. And he responds by letting the lawyer speak. Like, I think Jesus would have responded the same way if it was a preacher. Like, you talk. <laughs> I know you like to talk. You talk. That's what he does with the lawyer. He says, you answer your own question. And so the lawyer answers well. In fact, the answer that the lawyer gives is the same answer that Jesus gives when he is asked what the greatest commandment is. Love God, love your neighbor. But the lawyer's not done. He wants to pin Jesus down. He says, but, but, but Jesus, who is my neighbor? What are, the, what are the boundaries of my neighborhood? How far do I really have to go? With, like, if he's two miles away, do I have to be a good neighbor? Like, th that's what Pharisees do, though. Right? They want to pin you down to specifics so that, so that they can enforce the rules. Because the rule is what's important. That's how we wound up with 1,512 Sabbath rules. Because we got to have all the right rules. Jesus isn't, isn't, it's like, no. It's, it's not about, it's not about how far you have to go. It's about being a neighbor to everybody. They want to nail down specifics. And Jesus answers with a story that answers both of the lawyer's questions. What do I have to do to be saved? And who is my neighbor? And the scenario in the story, it, I mean, it seems plausible to us, but it would have really made sense to the lawyer. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho is dangerous. People, real people traveled that road, real people were attacked and left for dead. In fact, if you go back to the book of Joshua, you'll see that that road is nicknamed the Path of Blood. And so this real person in the story is on this road and is attacked and left for dead. And the first people that pass by this stranger are holy people. Right? They're holy people. And the lawyer would have saw them as being holy people who were already good with God because they're following all the rules, right? They're doing all the important things. But the context of their story makes their excuses for not stopping invalid. See, their excuses, ostensibly, that by Bending over and touching what could be a dead guy, they would be made ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. And then they couldn't do their job as priests and Levites in the temple. There are two things wrong with that. One, they're traveling away from the temple. They're not traveling to Jerusalem, they're traveling away from Jerusalem. And two, when... Priests and Levites are traveling to the temple to do work. They travel in groups, not alone. These two are alone. So the excuse that they would be ceremonially unclean is invalid. It would be inconvenient for them. But being unclean for 24 hours or seven days, is that worth stopping to help someone who... Who is dying? I think so. I think so. So the holy people pass by the victim. And the guy who stops is a lowly Samaritan. Now, the lawyer, as a good Jewish man, would have despised the Samaritans. In fact, when Jesus asks him who the, best, who the neighbor was... The lawyer can't even say the word Samaritan. He's like, uh, the one who helped him. The one who showed mercy to him. It's like he can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. That's how much he reviles the Samaritans. But it's the Samaritan who shows 
how to be a good neighbor, how to fulfill the second part of the greatest commandments, to love God, not just be obedient, love God, but love people, love your neighbor. The Samaritans are the ones, the Samaritan is the one who does it, who shows him the right way. Now, I've got a few takeaways from this story. First, your neighbors are not determined by where you live. They're determined by where you are. They're not determined by where you live. They're determined by where you are. Your house may be surrounded by people who love Jesus already. Hey, we're good. Everybody around me loves Jesus. My work here is done. I have fulfilled my mission. Hmm. There are more people. It's not just where you live, it's where you are. Jesus expands the definition of neighbor to mean every person you encounter. That means the people at, your, at the coffee shop. That means the people at the gas station, the grocery store, the restaurant, the doctor's office. Wherever you go, wherever you meet people, and you do, You are supposed to be a good neighbor to them. He just asks us, just love the people that are around you. So, your neighbors aren't determined where you live. They're determined by where you are. Second, holiness is not a state of being. It's a state of doing. Holiness is not a state of being, it's a state of doing. Loving God and being obedient to Him is important. That, that is absolutely important. But that love of God has to be demonstrated by our interactions with people. Our faith is one that has to be lived out. Notice what Jesus says to the lawyer at the end. He doesn't say, go and be like the Samaritan. He says, go and do what the Samaritan does. Holiness is not a state of being. It's a state of doing. Third, you don't have to be a Christian to be a good neighbor. But you have to be a good neighbor if you're a Christian. There are plenty of people in the world who are just good people. Like, I can tell you story after story of people who've helped their neighbors, who've mowed their yard, who've taken them food when they're sick, and they don't have anything to do with Jesus. Something in them just says, you know what, I just want to be good to people. That's awesome. We're different. If you're a follower of Jesus, your faith should compel you to be a good neighbor. It should compel you to help your neighbor. It is your love for Jesus that overflows into your relationship with your neighbor. God loves your neighbor. Why shouldn't you? You don't have to be a Christian to be a good neighbor, but you have to be a good neighbor if you're a Christian. Fourth, and this is the hard part, being a good neighbor will cost you something. It will cost you something. It costs the Samaritan time. It costs the Samaritan money. And you may not have an abundant supply of either. Can I just tell you that does not get you off the hook. The real cost is placing others' needs above your own. That's the real cost. Remember what Paul says to the Philippians. He says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Being a good neighbor isn't about you. It's about them. And it doesn't have to be complicated or expensive or time-consuming. It can be as simple as offering them mercy and grace. It can be as simple as saying hello, being kind, it can be simple. 
But just know that being a good neighbor will cost you something. So let's tie a bow around everything we've talked about. The Great Commission, make disciples. The greatest commandments, love God, love your neighbor. Those two things are inextricably linked. And the most effective way to fulfill our mission to make disciples is to love people well. To show them, to show them what a relationship with Jesus looks like and let them be drawn to him drawn to the love of Jesus. And so this series, we'll be talking about practical ways that you can do that. That's the purpose of this whole series. But I wanted to start with our mission, our purpose, the why of what we do. He put people around you for a purpose, to find him. And he put you in the midst of those people for a purpose, to love them, So they're drawn to him. It is a perfectly orchestrated plan. God is amazing. So every week, at the end of the message, I'm going to give you homework. Because I like homework. I don't like homework. I like for you to have homework. That's that's the truth. So I'll call it a live-it-out assignment. That's what we'll call it. Because what we want to do is take what we learn and apply it to our lives when we leave this building. So you have two live it out assignments this week. Live it out assignment number one, pray. Pray. Simple. Easy, easy tasks. Paul talks to Timothy uh, in his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. He says this to Timothy. He says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Pray for them. And then he says, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful lives and quiet lives and godliness and holiness. And then listen, listen to what verse 3 and 4 says. This is good and it pleases God our Savior. You're showing, you're demonstrating your love for God in the things that you do, praying for people. And God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Remember your purpose. You are here to point people to him. So start, straight, start praying. Pray for the people you meet. Pray for the people that you encounter. Pray for your neighbors. Start praying for opportunities to show the love of Jesus to people around you. Start, start praying for their heart to be opened to the love of Jesus. Start praying for your heart to be willing to love them well. Whatever you do, start praying. Assignment number one. Assignment number two. Also simple, but slightly more difficult than the first. <laughs> right? Assignment number two. Practice. Pray. Practice. Paul says in Romans 15 too, he says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Look for ways this week where you can love your neighbor, where you can do things that please them. It doesn't have to be monumental things. It can just be random acts of kindness, but it's important. Start now. Practice loving your neighbor. And we'll talk about other ways you can do that throughout this series. But here's the thing. You don't know. You may be, without ever saying a word about Jesus, you may be planting a seed that someone else waters and someone else cultivates and that Jesus makes grow into a saving faith. That is incredible and that's the way God works so I'm looking forward to this journey of learning how to be a good neighbor how to be Jesus next door remember there are hundreds and thousands of people that you run into 
who are hurt and who are suffering and who have been left for dead on the side of the road. And we can be holy people and pass them by. Or, or we can be the people that Jesus calls us to be. And we can love them well. And we can pick them up and take them to Jesus. Just show the love of Jesus to them. So this week, as you run into those people, I'm just asking you, be like the Samaritan this week. No, do like the Samaritan this week. Would you stand with us as we worship him? Thank you.